The Legend of Zelda is a series that is best known for its grand sense of adventure and captivating gameplay, and throughout its lifetime it's managed to grow from just a single title on the NES to one of the most recognizable video game franchises of all time. Everybody knows the story of the hero Link trying to save Princess Zelda from the evil clutches of Ganon, but what would happen if you made a Zelda game without any of that. When a franchise gets as popular as Zelda has, it's pretty common for the creators to experiment and push the boundaries of what makes their IP so special. For a spin-off to be done successfully, it has to expand on the world of the franchise it exists in while also retaining what fans love about the original property in the first place. And this can be easier said than done sometimes. You could end up with a pretty cool untold story in a world that you already love, or you could end up with a game that barely resembles the series it's supposed to be coming from. The longer a series goes on, it becomes more and more common to see entries try out different gameplay styles, emotional tones, or even main playable characters. So in the past 37 years, you can't even imagine what Zelda's been up to. That's right, amidst the sea of iconic mainline Zelda titles lies a storied history of a whole heck of a lot of lesser known games as well, and they can only be referred to as the Zelda spin-off games. Each of these games have attempted to add their own unique twist to the beloved Zelda formula and come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Like, a lot of shapes and sizes. There is a wide, wide range of games that fit under the Zelda umbrella. So, just as a warning, we're gonna be talking about games that are a bit more interesting in concept than Mario and his friends going out to play a game of golf. Really weird games and even some strange console peripherals are on the menu today, because I'm going to be covering every single Zelda spin-off game in one single video. Making this video has sent me down a rabbit hole I couldn't possibly have predicted when I started, and as the word count continued to climb, my sanity continued to plummet. So if you do enjoy this video, throw me a like and a comment, and watch it all the way to the end, because that way, it will almost have made all of this pain worth it. And while we're talking anyway, if you haven't seen my last video, I would encourage you to go watch it. So with all that nonsense out of the way, this is every Zelda spin-off ever. Let's begin where all good stories do. 1989. In 1989, there were only two mainline Zelda titles available to be played, the original Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link. But that didn't stop Nintendo from releasing what we can consider to be the first ever Zelda spin-off game. What could it be? What will it play like? And better yet, whatever could it be called? Zelda. It's... It's called Zelda. Yes, this little piece of magic is Zelda on Game & Watch. The twelfth Game & Watch to utilize this prophetic clamshell design, the Zelda Game & Watch is just about as advanced and amazing as you would expect from a handheld gaming console in 1989. It kinda sucks. Having two screens is of course pretty cool for the time, even if they had already been using it for a while, but the gameplay on this thing is... Well, it's understandably basic. You just sort of move back and forth to kill this guy on the right side of the screen, you climb up into the next room, and rinse and repeat until you get to kill a dragon. It's actually kind of cool that there's an entire separate boss fight area, and although it's pretty repetitive by today's standards, it was probably a blast to play through over and over again in the 80s. There's also an enemy that will attack you from below, and shots that come at you from behind as well, so there's actually a lot to keep track of if you want to be successful in this one. For the first ever Zelda spin-off, it's not too bad. It certainly could have been a whole lot worse, as I'm sure we're going to see later. It's a product of its time that is understandably repetitive and simple, and there's not really any real reason to go back to try and play this one. Moving on, next up we have the Zelda Game & Watch, which came out- wait, no, I just did that. Uh, oh, oh! I'm so sorry everyone, we just went over the release of the Zelda Game & Watch, released in 1989, but now I'd like to go over the Zelda Game Watch, released also in 1989. 
Note the removal of the word and here. This little ditty is an actual wristwatch with a tiny LCD screen made by Nelsonic Industries. Never heard of them? Well, you're not alone. I found out that they apparently made these sort of kids game watches through the 80s and 90s and had a number of licensing deals in their catalog. Things like Pac-Man, Frogger, and yes, even The Legend of Zelda made an appearance on one of these tiny, tiny screens. It goes without saying that I don't actually have one of these and I can't play it, but it was apparently a very simplified version of the concept seen in the original Legend of Zelda. Fight through four dungeons using your boomerang and sword to defeat a whole whack of enemies. Yeah, I'm sure this thing was absolutely thrilling to play with sitting on the bus holding a magnifying glass. There's just almost no way this thing was actually any good. I can only imagine how bad the controls must have been to play Zelda on a watch. Are you kidding me? I have a pretty hard time believing this would be better than the Game & Watch game that came before it in any way at all. And since I can't play it myself, that's just where my opinion's going to stay. It's an interesting stop in the spin-off journey nonetheless. We're moving right along, and I know the watch was kinda weird, but this one, this one takes the cake. Not because of the contents of the game itself, but more because of how the game itself is played. Say goodbye to your sanity and hello to the Barcode Battler 2, a handheld platform made by Epochco. The idea for this handheld was to fight enemies as a warrior by scanning the barcodes off the various cards. The barcodes would then tell the Barcode Battler, my god, I cannot believe that's actually the name of this thing. The barcodes would tell the console what enemies you were fighting or what items and power-ups you wanted to use in the in the fights. Think of it almost like the ancient grandpa to the Nintendo e-reader on Game Boy Advance. But instead of having a Game Boy Advance to play anything you wanted on as well as being able to scan cards, the barcode battler could only scan cards and was basically just a glorified calculator. This guy had no graphics to be seen anywhere. It was an LCD display with a couple columns of numbers and that was it. You would scan cards, crash numbers together, and it would tell you if you won or lost. Needless to say, I'm not too sure I get the appeal of this thing. And because of the way the Barcode Battler worked, it means there wasn't really separate games for it per se. Instead, they just released themed card packs with unique barcodes to represent the different aspects of the pack's theme. And this, of course, is where the Zelda spin-off comes in. Zelda no Den... <laughs> God damn it. Zelda no Densetsu Kamigami no Triforce. I don't get paid enough for this. Was a collection of 30 Zelda theme cards released in 1992 and based on a link to the past. I've already gone over why the gameplay isn't exactly riveting, but at least the artwork is nice enough. I'm sure these cards all together would be a shining star to any Zelda collection and would look great if they were all displayed together. But at this point, you can probably come to expect that with these older quote unquote games. Super weird and super old school, the idea that you could walk into a Walmart and choose between buying this or an original Game Boy leads me to believe anyone who had one of these should be put in jail. For life. That's enough about these ancient relics from the caveman days, let's talk about something a little more modern. One of Nintendo's favorite things to do in more recent Zelda history is re-release all the games in HD. From the N64 remakes on 3DS and the HD ports of Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword, all the way up to the full remake of Link's Awakening, it seems that every Zelda game is destined to receive a modern release at some point in the near future. But this Zelda remake trend runs much, much deeper than you might have originally thought. Yes, so deep it started digging 28 years ago to be exact. Say hello to BS Zelda, which I'm sure a lot of you have probably never heard of, so strap yourself in. We're going for a ride. The only thing Nintendo loves more than remaking Zelda games is their weird obsession with creating strange peripherals for their consoles, and back 30 years ago, that was even more true than it is now. In 1995, Japan saw the release of the Satellaview, a brand new peripheral to be used with their version of the Super Nintendo, the Super Famicom. The Satellaview was an add-on that slotted into the bottom of the Super Famicom and allowed for the player to connect to a satellite radio station in order to play limited release versions of games during specific showtimes, hence the name BS Zelda for Broadcast Satellite. 
Yeah, get your mind out of the gutter. The Satellaview costs over half the price of the Super Famicom itself, and you could only use it while the broadcast was live for most games. This high entry point, combined with the limited playtime availability and never knowing what games you were going to get, means it didn't exactly take a genius to figure out why the Satellaview didn't set the world on fire. But while it was still up and running, one of the many games that was run through the service was BS Zelda, a Super Famicom remake of the original Legend of Zelda. The game was released in four parts, once a week throughout August of 1995. Each broadcast included a new section of the game to play and would carry over your progress, so it was probably pretty exciting to see more and more of the game open up each week. And I gotta be honest, it looks great. The sprites look awesome in 16-bit, and they don't stray too far from the original designs either. Besides the sprites, the other obvious upgrades is all the different colors on screen at once, and it really helps to make the enemies and environments pop out way more. BS Zelda has a couple differences that aren't visual as well. It uses an 8x8 overworld instead of the 8x16 in the original. The yellow rupee flashes between a yellow and more red-orangish color this time around, but other than that, it's still worth one and the blue is still worth five. It would be cool to play through the original Zelda with BS Zelda sprites, but as it currently stands, there's not a whole lot of reason to get your hands on a copy of BS Zelda, even with emulation. It's really nice to look at, but it doesn't offer a whole lot in terms of unique gameplay experience in my opinion. And now that we're done with the Satellaview, NOT! Nope, there was actually another Zelda spinoff on the Satellaview, or even Another two spin-offs. There was another re-release, this time of A Link to the Past, but it's mostly the same as the original version, unlike the redone sprites and map in the first game. Next up though, they released something crazy. They decided to release a sequel of Link to the Past, reusing the game's assets, just like when Jorah's Mask was to Ocarina of Time. This Link to the Past sequel is known as The Legend of Zelda The Ancient Stone Tablets, and offers a completely original story with its own characters, dungeons, and side quests. I don't know about you, but considering how beloved Link to the Past is, it's pretty wild to me that it has a secret sequel that I've literally never heard of. But that is the whole point of this video after all, so let's dive into it. You once again plays the Satellaview's avatar character, transported to Hyrule six years after Ganon was defeated by Link in A Link to the Past. You quickly find out Zelda's been having a recurring dream, and she tells you you may be the prophesized hero of light. That's good enough for you to set out to defeat the monsters in the various dungeons and collect the mysterious ancient stone tablets, which when translated give the location of the power needed to destroy Ganon's spirit forever, the Silver Arrows. One climactic boss fight later, and roll the credits. Similarly to BS Zelda, Ancient Stone Tablets was playable over four weeks and four one-hour sessions, with progress carrying over in between. There's honestly just a lot to this game for me to go over here, and could probably be a topic for an entire video on its own. You may have noticed this banner at the bottom of the screen with scrolling text, and this was an addition made to the emulator to allow you to see what the script for the original broadcast would have sounded like. As you played, actors would read out hints and tips as the characters from the game in real time, which which is pretty crazy for the 90s. According to their website, they even made an actual audio recording that plays through the game so you can listen while you play, but I couldn't seem to get that to work for whatever reason. Either way, shout out to the team over at ZeldaLegends.net for going the extra mile, and if you want to check out the game for yourself, that's where you can find it. It's pretty crazy that there's a literal sequel to Link to the Past from 30 years ago that's never seen any kind of official re-release, but Maybe this game is what inspired the idea behind A Link Between Worlds anyway. Overall, it's really cool to experience an actual sequel to Link to the Past made by Nintendo themselves. But even with that being said, it by no means holds a candle to the original game. The timing restrictions and piecemeal distribution that they were dealing with means the gameplay and puzzles are significantly watered down compared to the first game. But it's still a really cool playthrough and I would recommend it to any fans of Link to the Past. Now we can really get into the meat of the Zelda spin-off pie. Hey, want to fight the forces of evil in Korodai? Check it out. It's easy. If we're going to talk about spin-off games, why don't we talk about the spin-offiest of them all? Link the Faces of Evil, and Zelda the Wand of Gamelon. For those who don't know, all 
two of you, I guess. These games were not made by Nintendo at all. They were released in 1993 through a licensing deal for the Philips CDI. Without getting too into it, and I probably will get too into it anyway, way back when, Nintendo and Sony were partnering up to make a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo. But they didn't quite see eye to eye while they were working on it, so Nintendo just sort of decided to abandon ship and pursue creating the add-on with a rival of Sony at the time, Philips. Sony took what they had started with Nintendo and ran off to make the first PlayStation, while Nintendo also failed to make the CD-ROM add-on with Philips. So similarly to Sony, Philips was able to take what they were making and release it on their own. But unlike Sony, Philips was able to use Nintendo properties on their new hardware as part of the deal for dissolving the contract. And boy oh boy, when I say they used this license to make some Zelda spin-offs, these games spun off so hard, they might as well have landed on another planet. Most Zelda fans are already familiar with these titles, and that's for good reason. It's not because of their legendary game design or storytelling like you might be used to with other classic Zeldas. Oh no, these games are known for their outlandishly terrible design and outright meme-worthy cutscenes and voiceover. These games effortlessly strip away everything that made the other Zelda games at the time feel special, and feature incredibly clunky and unresponsive controls with boring, repetitive Competitive gameplay. Combine the poor combat and puzzles with the generic fantasy setting and downright creepy character interactions, it's not hard to see how these games ended up being pretty poorly received even at the time. The full motion video cutscenes were supposed to be a marvel of the CD based technology being used but instead ended up making the game feel more like a fever dream than anything else. I can't even decide on what cutscene to show you to get my point across, cause they're all just as bad as each other. Either way, I dare you to try and think of what you would have thought seeing this on your TV screen 30 years ago. Hey Zelda, wake up! What, Link? You've saved me! Yeah, it's not good. If I were to say one positive thing about these games, I think it's interesting that they went for a dual release a full eight years sooner than the Oracle games did it. At the time, having two games running on the same engine released simultaneously with different stories was a pretty novel idea. I know it's hard to imagine considering Pokemon games have been doing that for what feels like forever now, but these titles were actually kind of ahead of their time in this way. That and you do get to play as Zelda in Wand of Gamelon, which people are still asking the mainline titles to do to this day. That being said though, if this is considered playing as Zelda, yeah, I think I'd rather not play it all. Before we move on from the Philips CDI though, there was actually one more Zelda game released on the platform, simply called Zelda's Adventure. It's not nearly as interesting or hilarious as the other two, and moves away from the comically bad category into the category of, well, just plain bad. It does have the top-down style of the original Zelda and Link to the Past at least, and you once again play a Zelda, which does get a bonus point from me. The other games have a level of ridiculousness to them that makes them stand out in a bizarre and absurdist way, so Zelda's adventure in comparison just feels boring. You just sort of wander around and try to collect things in the most boring take on the original Zelda formula I've ever seen. Honestly, there's just not really much to say about this one other than it's bad. Don't play it. Besides, I just realized we've been neglecting someone. We need to take some time to talk about the legendary hero himself. The man who is met with nothing but unanimous praise and uproarious applause everywhere he goes. The one, the only... Tingle is a character whose first appearance was in Majora's Mask as a map salesman, and he's been loved by fans ever since? Well, if nothing else, he certainly is unique. Tingle is essentially just an average Joe in the Zelda universe who wants so badly to be a Kokiri and get a fairy of his own that he does, well, whatever this is. He even says himself, he's already 35 and no fairy has come to him yet. But that won't stop Tingle from chasing his dream. You'll get your fairy one day, Tingle, I know you will! I honestly really like the idea of someone like Tingle existing in the Zelda universe. Like, all the normal people have no idea that fairies actually exist, and they've just heard about them in stories or whatever. But Tingle, no, he lives and dies by his need to get a fairy of his own. Regardless of what you think of Tingle, though, I'm sure you know what I'm about to say, considering this is a video all about spin-off games, but don't you think that any character with this much 
like passion and drive seems ripe for the picking to get a game of their own. Well, here it is. Freshly picked tingles. What? Actually, wait a minute. Let's ignore that for a second. We actually have to go back a tiny bit to Tingle's Balloon Fight on DS. Oh yeah, we're digging deep into the obscurity pile now, baby. This is a Japanese game that was released for Club Nintendo members only, and it's literally just Balloon Fight from the NES, but with Tingle in it. There is some multiplayer functionality, but even still, not a whole lot to be seen here. I never was very much a fan of the original Balloon Fight, and adding Tingle to it doesn't exactly make me enjoy it more. Quite the opposite, really. I've done my duty by letting you know it exists, and that's what I came here to do. Next up, we have another bite-sized outing with Tingle in the Too Much Tingle Pack, an application that was available to download through DSiWare on the Nintendo DSi. And if you don't know what the DSi is, it was just a super quick re-release of the DS at the end of its lifespan that had a few additional features. And of course, one of those features was downloadable apps, just like this one. It wasn't really so much a game as it was just a collection of simple apps with a tingle skin on top of it. Yeah, you really missed out, didn't you? It has a timer, a coin flipper, a tip calculator, and even a fortune teller. Wow. I'm either gonna win the lottery or I just got cursed. The Too Much Tingle Pack can really only hold your attention for a total of five minutes, but at least it has some character to it, even if that character is well, whatever this is. It never managed to leave Japan, and sure, it might have been slightly more useful in 2009 when not everyone had a smartphone in their pocket, but now, the most praise I can give this thing is... Yeah, I mean, I guess it's mildly interesting. It's a bit weird, but also really doesn't have that much more to say about it. So why don't we go ahead and check out Tingle in something a little bit more substantial. Can I ask for that again, but without the tingle? That's right, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's finally time we talked about the spin-off game that's all about rupees. Freshly picked Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land, released in Japan and in European regions for the Nintendo DS. I guess a Tingle spin-off really was ripe for the picking, wasn't it? For some reason, North America was never able to see this game hit store shelves. Okay, I take it back. I think I know why. In this game, you not only play as Tingle, but you get to see the story of how Tingle becomes Tingle. Because yeah, apparently becoming a Tingle is something that can just happen to people. And in this game, that person is you. You're gonna be a Tingle and you're gonna like it! On a day just like any other, you hear a voice calling out to you, and you soon find yourself face to face with none other than... This? Yes, in the first minute of the game, you come face to face with none other than the rupee equivalent of Jesus himself. It can surely only get better from here. Before you know it, Uncle Rupee here convinces you to leave behind the life you once knew in order to take on the noble duties of tingleism. And no, that's not actually a term that they use in the game, but let's be honest, you wouldn't be surprised if it was. Mainly, your job is to collect as many rupees as possible in order to build a tower and reach the ultimate life of leisure in a place called Rupee Land, where all your wildest dreams will come true. You'll have limitless money, and more importantly, every woman on the planet will be in love with you because of your limitless money. It's not going to be easy to collect all these rupees though, and you can guarantee that a Tingle game will have you running into all sorts of wacky characters and scenarios along the way. Yeah, that's right. It's time for the deep Tingle lore, baby. You're really getting what you came for in a video like this now, aren't ya? Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land is a very, very strange game, to the point I'm not even sure what genre to categorize it as. It's not really an RPG, but also, it kind of is. Pretty much everything you do is based around trying to collect as many rupees as possible. But that also means that everything in the game is designed to also take rupees away from you. Enemies, townspeople, even the companions you get want nothing more than to make you cough up as many rupees as possible to them. This game is so rupee dependent, you don't even have a health bar. It's just like, hey, having fun? Yeah, just so you know. Just, just want to make it clear, if you ever do run out of rupees, you die. This may not sound like a problem, but the main part of the game will be sucking up all your rupees at any chance it gets. So all these little things on top can feel like a bit much. Rosie Rupee Land uses a bargaining system with pretty much every character you'll meet. Whenever you buy something from someone, ask for information, or do them a favor, you have to play this little guessing game where you name your price and see if they're willing to settle on the deal. 
It's a neat idea, and for a game based around rupees, it's cool that you have to decide for yourself what things are worth. You don't ever want to guess too high, because you could end up drastically overpaying for something and keep yourself from reaching your next rupee goal. But you also don't want to ever go too low, because oftentimes characters will just be so insulted by your price that they won't give you anything. And not only that, a lot of the time, they'll keep the money you tried to give them, meaning you have to pay for it again, but even higher this time. So now, it seems like it's best to try to be respectful with your offers, and it's generally better to slightly overpay for something than it is to offer something too low and have to pay for it twice, but if you do that, suddenly you don't have enough rupees to actually progress the story because you've been overpaying for everything, and now you have to grind bug bones into fireworks and walk back and forth to the town 20 times to sell them to the creepy old man! I have no idea what is considered a fair price for any of this stuff. How could I? I've never been here before! What am I playing?! It is a cool idea for the main mechanic of the game, but it was so frustrating to be thrown into a town and immediately feel like I'm being forced to waste my most valuable resource. At least start the game off with some kind of ballpark for how much things should cost before I need to blindly guess what I should pay for them. Just knowing that I was overpaying for pretty much everything from a shop and I couldn't maximize the reward from doing favors for people is enough to drive me absolutely crazy. Especially when, as I said, if you run out of rupees, you die. I wouldn't be complaining about this as much as I am, but I actually did end up having to grind quite a bit to make it through the game because I found myself always falling short of raising the tower to the next level by the time I'd done all the main missions. And that's never fun. I would like to say it gets a bit easier the more you get used to the game, but the prices continue to go up at an unseen rate under the surface as you get further into the story. So I just felt like I was flying blind the entire time, and if anything, having to guess the prices might actually get worse the longer you play. All of this being said though, easily the best part of the game is all of the different characters. The companions you get, called bodyguards, can be used to help you fight or gain access to secret treasures. The fights themselves are pretty weird, honestly. You just sort of walk into enemies and you get this Looney Tunes style rumble and tumble animation as you tap the touchscreen and just sort of wait for it to be over. It's a funny idea for something like a one-off gag, but as the main combat mechanic in the game, it gets pretty boring and repetitive to watch for the battles over and over. The companions are awesome though, because they all have really unique designs, and I always enjoyed walking into the bar and seeing who would be waiting to work with me in every new area of the game. So as much as I did end up disliking the main mechanics of this game, I do still want to give credit where credit is due, and as you can expect from a game starring Tingle, the style and charm of this game is front and center. It looks and feels exactly like what you'd want a Tingle game to be, and the extremely weird characters and interactions almost made up for all the shortcomings this game had for me. I know you've been watching all this footage, but like, just look at the guys who repair the bridges for you. Boom. Enough said. Overall, I'd say Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land is very much worth playing for any hardcore Zelda fans out there, just because it's one of the strangest and definitely most unique games tucked under the very wide Zelda umbrella. Just don't expect it to be that fun, expect it to be really weird. It's that very special Tingle brand of weirdness that made me actually have a good enough time with it to say I'm glad I at least gave it a try. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've had just about enough tingle for the rest of my life. Let's get back on track and take a look at something a little more traditional. Hey look, another tingle game! Yes, there actually exists another tingle game. This time, it's a sequel to Rosy Rupee Land, ripened Tingle's Balloon Trip of Love. This game didn't make it to Europe like the first game did and stayed in Japan, and that fact doesn't exactly give me much hope for its quality. Thankfully though, it does actually have a fan translation available online that I'm able to play, so shout out to these lovely people for making this part of the video possible. And after spending some time with Balloon Trip of Love, I can easily say, it's actually a lot better than the first game. Don't get me wrong, it definitely ended up being even weirder than the first game somehow, but with that, it was a lot more fun to play. I don't even know how to begin explaining the setup for this game because it's all just gonna sound made up no matter what I say, but this is a point and click adventure game where you talk to people, pick up and combine items, solve puzzles, and make your way through the fantasy land of Oz. Oh, sorry, did, did you miss that? Yeah, 
As in, this game is you as Tingle heading down the literal yellow brick road and partnering up with the party we all know and love, the Cowardly Lion, Buriki, and Kakashi. Lightning Blade! The story may be way out of left field, but I think this style of point-and-click gameplay works a lot better for a Tingle game from the get-go. It means the focus is way more on the ridiculous characters and unconventional writing over anything else, which is what a Tingle game should do in the first place. But don't be fooled by the simple point-and-click mechanics at the beginning and think this game doesn't have any secrets in store for you, because you could not be more wrong. Things start off pretty simple. You pick up items and you solve puzzles to progress through the storybook and collect your party members along the way. There was some parts that tended to drag a little bit more through the story than I would have liked, but there's also a lot of standout moments in there as well. At one point, you're following the yellow brick road, but you lose your way because a farmer decided to pull up all the golden bricks from the road to build himself a house, which, uh, I mean, that's pretty hilarious. I played for a long time, and I thought I had got my fill of what this game had to offer, but then, just when I let my guard down and I least expected it, wham! Now you're playing a dating sim! As it turns out, Tingle needs to woo a bunch of ladies on his quest to meet up with the princess, but the only problem is they all think he's gross and ugly and weird. Because he is gross and ugly and weird. So, faced with immediate rejection from every woman you meet, you're forced to do the only thing a creepo like you can do to make girls like you and give them some gifts. So this is what makes our journey through Oz a balloon trip of love, huh? I thought this mechanic was a lot better than the rupee wagering from the first game. You still have an element of gambling because you don't know what people will like until you try to give it to them, but it feels a lot less detrimental to your progress if you make the wrong choice. Each gift you give also has different classifications that they fall into, and the game will tell you how many of the categories of that item the person likes without directly saying which ones they are. It takes a bit of strategy to try and choose your gifts based on what you think they like and what you have in your inventory and how those items have different combinations of categories, it's a nice diversion from the more straightforward gameplay of the main game. I'm really glad this popped up when it did because I was just starting to get bored of the basic gameplay loop. That, and it's also just sort of exciting to feel the harsh rejection of every single person that you meet. Just like in real life! Well, once again, this game has another trick up its sleeve, because even after pivoting to a completely different gameplay style two-thirds of the way through the story, we've only just begun. You do eventually, finally, get access to the signature Tingle balloon, and you'll never be able to guess as to what it allows you to do. In this point-and-click dating sim adventure game, this balloon, this balloon right here, yes, this balloon lets you travel through time. Yep. 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 It's no, it's no big deal, really. You can just casually decide to go back in time now whenever you would like. And as you can imagine, that opens up a pretty wide variety of new gameplay opportunities for you. You can go back to the previous areas you've been to and do all kinds of extra side quests and missions, but most of all, you can fix all the bad first impressions you made with all the pretty girls. This sure is a game that does exist. It's a really cool idea to do a super linear point and click game with an ability like this thrown in near the end, and it really opens the game up and lets you explore and mess around in ways that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. I think it's just genuinely a lot of fun. It seems like I've been talking about Tingle forever at this point, but if you're gonna play only one of the Tingle games, I'd probably recommend this one. It has a lot less glaring issues than the first game did with a much better storyline and some pretty clever puzzles to solve. Except the Junkyard Quiz. Fuck the Junkyard Quiz. It's a shame it never got an official English localization, but I guess everyone in Europe just didn't buy enough copies of the first game. Can you blame them? Now please, for the love of God, get me away from this thing! Thank God it's over. We're now pretty far into the point of the video where I continually talk about games you've never heard of, so let's go ahead and make our way over to the GameCube. Most people don't really seem to remember Four Swords Adventures, and it tends to get glossed over when thinking about the mainline Zelda titles. Sitting right next to Wind Waker and having a 2D gameplay style that was pretty much exactly the same as it was on Game Boy Advance probably wasn't doing it any favors. Regardless of its quality though, it's still considered a mainline Zelda game, and it won't be what we're talking about today. However, during E3 2003, when Nintendo showed off trailers for Four Swords Adventures, they also had another Zelda-themed trick up their sleeve. 
Although it wasn't part of their main presentation, Nintendo's press release mentioned a game known as Tetra's Trackers, with some news outlets even reporting that they were given a hands-on demonstration of the game. And with most of these news outlets reporting that it would be impossible for the game to be considered a full-scale Zelda release, the game was quietly cancelled and never heard from again. Or was it? Tetris Trackers, officially known as Navi Trackers in Japan, is a spin-off game that's included on the Japanese and Korean discs for Four Swords Adventures on GameCube. The game uses the Game Boy Advance Link Cable to accommodate up to four players at a time, just like the main game does. If you're unfamiliar, essentially each player would connect a Game Boy Advance to the GameCube through the controller ports to give them their own screen to play on while the TV would show any relevant information about the game to everybody. But sadly, that's about as much as I can say about Navi Trackers. I don't speak Japanese, and to get an emulator to run a Japanese GameCube title along with multiple virtual Game Boy Advances, just so I can try to play a Zelda party game that doesn't even work if you play it by yourself, alone in my room, talking to myself, yeah, I did do that. Here it is. Once again, I'm playing a fan-translated copy of the game, so thank you for making this part of the video possible. Although it is a bit different this time around, since this fan translation wasn't able to translate the Game Boy Advance assets, leaving the main play section of the game in full Japanese. Definitely less than ideal, but we can get through it. All we have to do is ask Tetra how to play. <laughs> Right. Got it. In Navi Trackers, you compete against your friends to score the most amount of points, running around an arena and trying to find different members of Tetra's pirate crew. Each of the crew members has a number, and you're essentially just trying to get to the next number before your friends do to earn medals. There's tons of different ways to earn points, and there's multipliers and special events that'll happen throughout the course of the game, but at the end of the day, your main objective is to get to the next crew member. And in case you can't tell where anything is on your tiny, tiny Game Boy Advance screen, Tetra has a map on the TV that shows you where all the pirates are at and all the other players. Although the map doesn't show you the location of the exact numbers, there are special events that can cause you to have a full view of the entire map and its contents for a small period of time. And that is super useful. It's a really unique idea for a game, and apparently it was based on one of Zelda director Eiji Aonuma's earlier titles, a Super Nintendo game called Marvelous Another Treasure Island. The game featured a stamp rally, where you would explore the island while a radio broadcaster gave you hints about the stamp's locations. Pretty impressive for the Super Nintendo, but it was all possible thanks to the power of... You're not gonna believe this. The Satellaview. Have you ever heard someone talk about the Satellaview this much in your entire life? How is this happening? When will this torture end? As you saw from the How to Play section, the game is entirely and fully voice acted, which is pretty crazy for a Zelda game from 2004. In addition to her map, Tetra is constantly narrating the match to you, and you even get to hear from Gonzo and Salvatore every once in a while. There's also a point where you get to unlock characters other than Tetra to narrate the match for you, which is actually really cool and unexpected. By the time you're done with the game, there's 12 maps in total and some small progression incentives like new stage elements and hidden collectibles, but I can see why people describe this as a pretty bare bones experience when they saw it at E3. I can see it maybe being fun with a couple Nintendo friends for about half an hour at most, but that's about it. Overall a really unique game and the voice acting idea is super cool. I just wish I could understand it. That, and there just needed to be a little more variety here in order to make this game worth it. But hey, at the very least, there is actually a single player mode that you can play if you have no friends like me. Instead of playing against other people using the colorful cast of Lynx, your main competition is none other than... Get. Me. Out. Now. I think it's finally time we can move into what I would consider to be the modern Zelda spin-off games. That is, right after you subscribe to the channel. I mean, what are you gonna do? Watch 40 minutes into a video and tell me you aren't enjoying it? For real though, these videos are a lot of work and they take forever to put together, so I appreciate you supporting the channel to tell me you'd like more videos like this in the future. Let's get right back to it. Starting off, we have Link's crossbow training on the Wii. This is a Twilight Princess spin-off that was bundled with the Wii Zapper, also known as Plastic Gun. 
It's pretty straightforward, where you just shoot at enemies and targets to rack up a combo and score as many points as possible. A lot of people didn't really know what to think about this game when it came out, and it was a bit weird to have what was essentially the Wii Sports of a random peripheral to be a Zelda game. Most reviewers complained that it was too short, but honestly, if it was any longer, it would be on the opposite end and probably overstay its welcome. There's on rails levels where you can't move, and there's also some free roaming third person arena type stages, which, I mean, hey, that's pretty cool. I think my personal problem with this game was always how reliant it is on the combo multiplier. I always wanted to spray down enemies as quickly as possible, but you get so heavily punished if you miss even a single shot in a level that it becomes much more of a careful and calculated accuracy test than anything else. It just slows the pace of the game down a lot, and oftentimes it's better to not even try to shoot at something if there's not a 100% guarantee that you're going to hit it. What's probably the most interesting fact about this game is that it uses a rupee that is unique only to this game, and with a unique shape as well. It may be orange, but don't let that fool you, this is surely a rupee unlike any we've seen before. It's different from the orange rupee from Twilight Princess because it has a much lighter, closer to yellow color, and it's quite stout and almost square in shape. It's worth a total of a thousand points, but it degrades quickly the longer it's on screen. I'm sure there's a whole argument we could have about if points for shooting it with a crossbow would equate to monetary value in Hyrule, but it's probably not worth your time to pick it up anyway, considering the fact it loses value just by being perceived. Other than that, Link's crossbow training is nothing more than a couple hours of entertainment that's packed in with some randomly shaped Wii branded plastic a marketing scheme that we were all too familiar with back in 2007. So that's it for Link's crossbow training, but did you know there's actually another Twilight Princess spinoff? Yeah, this one's actually a Zelda puzzle game, which I'm surprised we actually haven't seen yet. My Nintendo Picross, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is a mouthful of a game that was released in 2016 through the My Nintendo Rewards program for the 3DS. Picross uses a type of puzzle known as nonograms. They're logic puzzles where the squares throughout the grid have to be filled in to match the required numbers on the border of each row. Unsurprisingly, for this release, every puzzle shows an image related to Twilight Princess when you complete it. It really is a pretty simple title, mostly comprised of calmly and slowly working your way towards creating a picture of an item or character from the main game. Definitely not the most interesting of the Zelda spin-offs, but hey, I'm sure it's worth something to someone out there that you can spend 10 minutes filling in individual pixels of the mayor's diaper-covered ass. I think Picross is a decent puzzle game, and it scratches the same itch as a crossword puzzle without actually having to be good at spelling, so that's a thumbs up from me. And now it's finally time to talk about what I would call the most widely recognized Zelda spin-off, the Hyrule Warriors games. Hyrule Warriors is a series of hack and slash spin-off games developed by Koei Tecmo, and it's in the same gameplay style as the popular Dynasty Warriors series. Mow down hundreds and even thousands of enemies playing as a wide cast of your favorite Zelda characters with flashy special moves and some really outrageous cinematic finishers. Yeah, I can see the appeal of this. The original Hyrule Warriors was on Wii U, but it was eventually re-released on both the 3DS and the Switch. And honestly, they're all similar enough, we can talk about them at the same time. It may seem pretty surface level at first as you make your way through its fan service timeline converging storyline, but they really just needed an excuse to get all the different characters from the different games together in one place, and it was totally worth it. What it lacks in story, it more than makes up for in its gameplay. There's nothing like working your way through the cast one by one and finding a character that feels like they really mesh with your specific playstyle. I also think it's really cool to have a cast of characters that reaches this far and wide across the entire series. Like, what other game are you going to play as Marin? The moment to moment action of the game just feels really great with its huge hordes of enemies and branching combo paths, and not to mention the presentation is top notch as well. A lot of these characters and environments have never looked better, and the music for this game is simply on another level. I didn't think this would be a game I would enjoy when all the previews were coming out, but after actually getting my hands on it, I realized how wrong I was. The Switch version has a lot of extra things that I haven't personally been able to check out, but I know it's being thrown into a game that was already full to the brim, so it's hard to say no. Then we got a proper second Hyrule Warriors in 2020 with Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. Age of Calamity may not be quite as packed as the first game, but when you're up to the third version of a game, you're bound to have a lot of extra stuff in there. The main difference 
difference between the original game and Age of Calamity is the story and setting. Age of Calamity takes a much more grounded approach. It's based on the story of Breath of the Wild and takes place 100 years before the events of that game. Surprisingly, by the end of the story, it turns out to just be as nonsensical and non-canon as the first Hyrule Warriors, but I still think it's a good setting for the game either way. It plays pretty similarly to the first Hyrule Warriors, but this time you're restricted to locations and characters from Breath of the Wild. I know this was an intentional choice, but I can't help but feel it's a bit bland compared to the first game. I will say they nailed the style of the game though, like everything from the menus to the health bars really makes it feel like you're playing a Breath of the Wild prequel, which is great. The gameplay is still just as fun as the first game though, and I personally am a pretty big fan of these games, so I would challenge you to give them a try even if you think the gameplay footage isn't your cup of tea. These games are also notable for their insane replay value, as there is literally hundreds and hundreds of hours of content in these games, if you're willing to get through it all that is. Aside from the main story missions, there's also an adventure mode with a giant sprawling mission map where you're sure to be spending a lot of your time. Oh, sorry, did I say map? I meant maps as in five adventure maps to take care of that get progressively more and more difficult. Plus, there's a ton of crafting materials to collect for unlocking skills and making dishes of food for one-time power boosts, so replaying stages never really feels like a waste of your time anyway. And also, I'm sure you've noticed the adventure maps have this classic Zelda sprite look to them in the first game. Like, this is awesome! Who wouldn't love this? And speaking of classic Zelda, why don't we take one more look at a Zelda Game & Watch. This time it's the 35th anniversary edition. This little bad boy came out in November of 2021 and sports a more classic game and watch look. It has Zelda 1, 2, and Link's Awakening emulated in English and Japanese, as well as this throwaway real game and watch game with Link's face on it. A neat little tidbit about these things is the Japanese versions of the games have the Famicom disc system audio that we never got in the West. There's also a clock so you can watch Link run around and also tell the time. It's mostly just a cool collector's item, and if it were me, I'd probably just be keeping it in the box, as it doesn't really seem like what it has to offer for entertainment outweighs the collection value by keeping it sealed. Yeah, yeah, don't fucking judge me. And last but certainly not least, we have Cadence of Hyrule. This is a spin-off made by the developers and in the style of the popular indie game Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is a rhythm-based dungeon crawling game with procedurally generated levels. Unlike a regular dungeon crawler though, you can only move or attack with your character if you do so on the beat of the music that's playing in the background. Defeat monsters, collect items and weapons, and last for as long as possible. It's a pretty nice little gameplay loop that is really satisfying to play with, and it works surprisingly well given the Zelda coat of paint. There's tons of familiar locations, items, and characters to play as, but it goes without saying that the remixes of the music you get are definitely the stars of the show. They even did a couple DLC packs for this game, so there's a lot to play through if it's your kind of thing. Honestly, it's pretty tough to say something bad about this game, other than I can see how people could find it a bit too repetitive, but I don't think most people would have that issue. It's really awesome to see Nintendo was open to lending out the Zelda IP in this way, and I hope they're more open to doing collaborations like this in the future, because this one turned out great. If you're a Zelda purist and not usually a fan of picking up random indie games on the eShop, this would be a great one to start with, and who knows, it could be your jumping off point into a whole other world of the gaming industry. And with that... I think we're done? That was every single Zelda spin-off game ever released. There was some high highs, some low lows, and a little bit of everything in between. But at the end of the day, I think the concept of what makes a Zelda game a Zelda game is a lot, lot broader than any of us could have ever imagined. If you want to see more stuff like this, remember to subscribe and like the video to let me know this is the kind of stuff you want to see. And hey, maybe even leave me a comment and let me know what you think I should talk about next. I'm doing a bit of a remake for my channel lately, so the feedback really is appreciated. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. It really does mean the world to me, and I hope to see you very soon in the next one. Bye bye for now.